For many serious professionals, the world of video games and business has always been seen as a separation between church and state. But with the video game industry now seeing many layoffs and disruptions, is it time for companies to break down those walls and look at new ways that games can help their businesses? We'll chat with one of the pioneers in this space on this episode of Today in Tech. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. Joining me on the show today is Sam Glassenberg. He is the CEO of Level X, which builds medical games designed to help doctors, nurses, and other health professionals maintain their skills and training. Welcome to the show, Sam. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited about this idea just because I, I, I've been living this for most of my life. Um, you know, this whole chep- separation of church and state. So I, I'm going to give you an example. In the 1980s, my uh, my dad would be complaining about my desire to use our computer to play games. And he would be like, oh, computers are a serious business and you shouldn't do this. But then we did see some educational games like Mavis Beacon teaches typing, Carmen San Diego, the Oregon Trail. You saw those educational games. But this never really translated into business training uh, tools or markets. So is there a stigma around the use of video games to help people learn more serious skills? Or did we get lost in this whole gamification movement from you know the past 10 years? Yeah, I think it's, it's a great question. So look, I, I think I mean, the 80s was that even the 90s was the heyday. We had really high production value games that we learned from. I learned way more history from like where in the world is Carmen San Diego right. than like I ever learned in history class. <laughs> but at some point it started to switch. I remember I was at LucasArts a little over 20 years ago as they shut down Lucas Learning. And Microsoft, I was at Microsoft while I remember they shut down some educational games divisions. There sort of became this point, maybe like 25 years ago, where the pure entertainment games were outperforming the sort of entertainment educational games. Right. And that created this like huge gap that I don't think has ever been recovered from. I think even if you look like in healthcare, for example, like medical training. You can literally look, I I can show you examples of like, you know, medical training is literally like the graphics, the, the, you know, the gameplay is about 25 years behind the state of the art in modern video games. Right, right. Um, So, so do you feel like this gamification idea just kind of fizzled or is it still out there and it's not necessarily something that is... Uh, as as in your face as it it might be seen as because I still I still take security training powerpoints rather than security yeah. training games that they could teach me better about some of these concepts. Right, correct. Because like when you think about it, for security and these other things, you need to develop a mental model of a system. Video games are by far the best way to do this. Like I learned how a city works from SimCity, um, and this is what we do at Level X. Like we teach you how you know complex uh you know biochemistry works by allowing you to play with hundreds of thousands of molecules like the best way to learn about about systems Mm -hmm. angry birds teaches you parabolic flight (laughs) the great way the best way to learn about systems is to play with it yeah this isn't a games thing like this is how humans have learned for hundreds of thousands of years or more this is how mammals we learn through play um, and yet what happened about 20, you know, 25 years ago, these things separated. And basically what happened was educational gaming got stuck with whatever the state of the art was in like 1995. Okay. And that created kind of like a vicious cycle where if you were a talented video game developer and you wanted to go you say, look, all right, you know, I want to apply my skills for, you know, education, you immediately had to compromise. Right. So instead of using, you know, the latest Unreal Engine and ZBrush and like all these, you know, video games industry moves fast, you're not using that anymore. Your stuff is going to look like, you know, 1995. And what that meant was it no longer, the best talent was no longer going into, uh, into those areas. I like to show, I like to show this example, like, you know, um, you know, this is from Activision, like this is, you know, Call of Duty, right? You okay. can zoom into the eye of one of the characters and, you know, this is the level of detail that we have in a modern, you know, in an eye in a modern video game. There's right. like all these overlaying technologies make that eye look real. Why? Because we want the character to be more realistic and believable. So the game's more fun. Okay. 
Now let's sit down in front of a 200 and I get this game for 50 bucks. Let's sit down in front of a $250,000 eye surgery simulator. <laughs> this is what we're training surgeons on, right? Uh, it looks like it fell out of a gumball machine. <laughs> like literally, this, this, what is this? Like Nintendo 64 is like 1995. Wow. Yeah, it's <laughs> nuts. And this is what surgeons and doctors are training on. And the problem isn't just that, oh, it doesn't look real. The problem is it doesn't behave realistically. Right. It can't capture the rare unforeseen scenarios that you're only going to encounter on a live patient in the operating room. So, 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 so do you feel, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sa sa Sam, do you feel like that the technology now that we're seeing in the 2020s is now good enough where companies could re- uh, relook at this space and start saying like, well, now we can actually provide better graphics and better, better training ideas. Or is there still the split between business and, and, and gaming companies? Um, and, and you get that bottom line profit discussion. The gap is about talent. Okay. The gap is talent. And I think that the reason is historically, you know, I, in a minute, I'll show you the games that we make at Level X. Sure. You know, Level X, we're, we're getting on stage at SIGGRAPH, right, and Game Developer Conference and showing off our stuff. And, you know, we'll we'll beat Epic, uh, Unreal, NVIDIA, you know, with our live demos because it looks so cool because we're using the latest video game tech. Right. But in order to do that, you need the best game talent. And that there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem there. So we've managed to solve it in our case in healthcare, but someone else is gonna to have to come in and solve it for those other disciplines that you've been talking about. Like you need to get real, not just game designers, you need to get really good game designers and really good artists and really good graphics folks because people like those people who can all work on, you know, Call of Duty or whatever game they want, like they're not gonna to want to work for a company that makes stuff that looks like Nintendo 64 games, or we call like things like, I'm air quoting here, like serious games that don't actually take game design seriously and aren't fun to play. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's, let's take a step back. I wanna ask you about uh, how you got involved in making uh, these medical video games and, and feel free to, and you can show me some of the examples because I do think they're really cool and it's not, and not an ad for your company. I just wanna say that upfront. Um, but you know, how do you, did you stumble into this? I mean, because you, you know, you mentioned LucasArts and Microsoft. So you have a history in the, the gaming industry. Yeah. So first off, yes, this is not, is not an ad for Level X. In fact, <laughs> what, what am I doing here? I'm getting on the show and I'm basically saying, hey, games, games folks, like, please go make my competition. Right, like, right. More people doing this. Obviously, yes, please come work for Level X. But if you want to go and, you know, like, go create another company that's go doing this stuff, in medicine or in another discipline, please, there are endless problems to solve um, and and also money to be made. Um, so yeah, so Level X was founded by accident. I would love to say it was some grand idea I had, but I literally stumbled into this by accident. Uh, I spent my career in video games. I used to work at LucasArts. I used to run the DirectX graphics team at Microsoft. My last company did games for Hollywood movies. Um, all of this, essentially made me the disgrace of my family <laughs> because I come from a long line of doctors. Uh -huh. uh, my grandfather was a famous doctor, both my parents, aunts, uncles. I'm the idiot who didn't go to medical school. Um, to show you how bad it got, this is uh, in 2006, I accepted a technical Emmy, not the Emmys they show on TV, the technical right, Emmy. Right. Same and um, for pushing the cutting edge of video game graphics, like on behalf of my team in DirectX, like DirectX won this. Also, NVIDIA, there's Jensen accepting his. Um, and he's and not so wearing, I, and he's not wearing a, le a leather jacket at this point. So this is pre no, no, leather no. jacket. Was, this was this was like 2006. <laughs> that, yeah, um, we're all wearing suits. So uh, although I think there was a dress code. In any case, um, so I call home to be like, hey mom and dad, I'm accepting an Emmy. My dad's an anesthesiologist. And without skipping a beat, he goes, yes, Sam, that's very nice. But in this family, we only recognize Nobel prizes. You're <laughs> wow. not yet 30. You can still go to medical school, <laughs> medicine and everything else. So finally, like a few years later, he gives up maybe a dozen years ago. He's like, Sam, you're too old for medical school. Put all this gaming nonsense to good use. Make me a game to train my colleagues to do a fiber optic intubation tricky procedure. We do it on difficult patients. So 
you know, please make me a game that they can just play on their phones. I don't want to drag anyone to the training center. Now I'm busy running this Hollywood game studio, making games for Hunger Games, Mission Impossible, Rocky. Sure, dad. <laughs> I sit down for three weekends. I throw together this crappy little game. I upload it to the app store. This is before test flight. So it's like, here you go. Your friends can download it themselves. Leave me alone. I don't think about it again. Here's your app. Two years later, he calls me. It's about a decade ago. He goes, hey, Sam, how many people downloaded the game? I go, Dad, I don't know how many of your friends downloaded your fiber optic laryngoscopy <laughs> video game, but we'll check for you. Right. I looked. We had 100,000 doctors, nurses, and airway specialists who've been playing it. Wow. Which, like, look, I make games for like tens of millions of players, sure. right? Fine. But like doctors, medical professionals, this is unheard of. So I Google it to try to understand what had happened. I put in like ilarynx at glassenberg.com, like some email I never check into iTunes. So like, okay, what happened? So I Google, I, I, I Google it. They've been doing efficacy studies at medical schools all over the world that showed this crappy game I made for my father is drastically improving physician performance. Wow. That's impressive. So I would, yeah, yeah, I would love to say that Level X was some grand idea. Nope, it was an accident. Like I literally, you know, all right, what if it wasn't just me? What if instead we took some of the top video game designers, artists, engineers who worked on Mortal Kombat, you know, Words of Friends, these games, and team them up with hundreds of physician advisors across every major therapeutic area in medicine to, like we say, advance the practice of medicine through play. We're and, having a lot of fun. Yeah, and and so, do you have an example of the uh, the colonoscopy uh, <laughs> app or game? Oh, so there's there's the knee. That's the gross one. We, we're gonna skip yeah, over yeah, that yeah. one. I always I always like to start a demo with a colonoscopy. Although for your <laughs> for your listeners on the podcast, we're gonna have to give them a yeah. You're gonna have a, to kind of give them a play by play. Yeah. yeah so sure, so, so these are quick. these are our mobile apps, right? Correct. Yes, they're mobile apps. Okay. So uh, here, let me let me load it up real quick. So yeah, I mean, literally, like we have five apps in the app store. You can download them: gastroenterology, cardiology, okay. pulmonology. You can actually earn continuing education credit toward renewing your medical license by playing them. They're all filled with real cases that have been submitted by doctors all over the country and the world. Um, here, we'll do a uh, we'll do a quick uh, we'll do a quick example. Um, so yeah, I always like to start a demo with a colonoscopy. So here I'm just doing this on my phone. Yep. Um, and you know, so here we are on the colon, um, but this isn't just a 3d model. This is a totally interactive virtual patient. What do I mean by that? Like everything's squishy. So okay. as you see, like, as I, I can grab anything anywhere with my forceps and it moves just like it would in real life. As I pull the tissue toward the light, it glows with subsurface scattering, like when you hold your hand up to the flash to a flashlight. So here I have like I can use different tools. It's a hidden object game, right? What am I doing here? I'm trying to find the hidden polyps yep. the hide behind folds. Um, here I've got one out in the open, so I'll grab it with my forceps and yank it. But what I don't realize is this is a rare condition where the polyp embeds on a blood vessel. When I remove it, uh -oh. I trigger a bleed, a meter inside the body. Yeah, it gets pretty gross. Yeah, okay. Uh, so here <laughs> here we have uh, 3D computational fluid dynamics running on a cell phone, the thing that drops my calls all the time. Yeah. Uh, so I'll try to spray the source of the bleed. Um, all that does is dilute the blood. So here, Keith, you can play doctor. All right. Uh, you want argon plasma or epinephrine? How do you want to treat this? Uh, let's do the epinephrine. Epinephrine, all right. Mm -hmm. we'll, take our, we'll take our endoscopic needle. Uh, our syringe. We'll inject some epinephrine. All right, good job. Oh, thank goodness. Bleeding stopped. Objective achieved. All right, so now I've got this mess of blood and water. We can find more polyps hiding yeah. under it, or I can just grab my argon plasma coagulator, cauterize <laughs> anywhere. Hippocratic oath doesn't apply. Oh my you gosh! All right, like so yeah, I'm going to right. cause so much damage. So, in the case. so, but this is, this is a real video game. Yeah, yeah. And so I want to get to the the next question, which you know how. How do these do these does this count as training for medical professionals or, or is it something that you use to supplement their existing training? Because, again, the first thing that would that, you know, freaks me out would be like, well, I hope my my uh, gastroenterologist or I, whoever's doing my colonoscopy didn't just basically learn how to do it, basically playing that game. I'm 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 hoping that it's used to enhance the training. 
Yeah. So we don't teach you how to become a doctor. So this is not something that you would see in a medical school, right? No, half, half the medical students in the country have at least one of our games on their phones, okay. but they're just playing it for you know, prep or whatever. Like, right, practice. This does not replace medical school. This does not replace cadaver labs. Yeah. This does not replace. No, the idea here is this augments it. Um, and so you, doctors are lifelong learners. They're super busy. The way they stay up to speed is basically by reading articles, you know, maybe watching a lecture and then taking a test and yeah. then they earn continuing education credit. Here, you can do that by playing a video game where we can actually score you based on, you know, how well you diagnose the patient. Did you order the right tests? Did you do the procedure? You know, how effectively did you do the procedure? And so we're actually able to measure skill. And more importantly, this is not designed to like, you know, just like a flight simulator. You're not going to like check a pilot by just having them fly back and forth between New York and LA. You're going to give them a scenario like multi-engine failure where the systems go out and all right, how do you handle it? This is what this is good at. So we, you know, Hey, you just think you're removing polyps. Oh yeah. Some are harder to find than others. Oh, there's a bleed. What are you going to do? Right. 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 These are the kinds of scenarios we give like the hardest, rarest, most difficult. Like we say like, you know, five life, each of these games has like five lifetimes worth of difficult cases. So you can really hone your skills. This is why, you know, like doctors and surgeons, for example, like the first hundred times they do any new procedure, the outcomes aren't as good as, you know, the next hundred. Why is that? They just need to play through all those 1% cases. Yeah. And so we're able to just let you play through them one after another. What's the feedback that you get from doctors and health professionals? Is it, is it like a typical gamer feedback where, you know, you know, you're sometimes afraid to, to hear what the community has to say, or is it, is it, is it more professional? <laughs> Um, no, like, I mean, doctors are brutally honest. Oh, I mean, okay. Let's... All of our stuff has like five stars in the app store. You can, the doctors love it, but that's because we've been play testing with them for months before we launch. Okay. Like doctors have no qualms about telling you, Hey, I think that doesn't look real. I think that, uh, you know, Oh, Hey, I got, I lost 10 points for doing this thing, but I shouldn't have lost 10 points for doing that thing because that's actually the right way to do it at my institution. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We do all of that. We have a stable of hundreds of physician advisors and contributors that are like play testing this stuff. So doctors are just like gaming nerds as well. Oh yeah. It's very similar. They're yeah. also intellectually curious. Uh -huh. They're competitive. You know, these are all like, they're dedicated to honing their craft. Like there's a lot of similarities. So, so could a lot of these concepts that, you know, you've introduced here around the medical video games, could they be used in other industries, especially ones that, that require continual training, continual education, you know, just off the top of my head, for example, I've thought of construction, field service, uh, even teachers, you know, they're kind you know, I know a lot of teachers that are like, yeah, we have to continually learn new concepts and, and, and new ideas that, but, and most of those are like you said, sitting, watching a lecture, reading a paper, something like that. Um, it just feels like this would be more fun for people that like learning through games. Definitely. There's applications. We say like anytime anyone needs to develop a mental model of a complex system, the games are the best way to do that. So when you think about construction, for example, understanding, I don't even, I don't even know what the challenges are, like new materials, new tools, new techniques, right? Being able to actually play with it. Mm -hmm. You know, in an environment where you can make mistakes, like how do humans learn? We learn from mistakes. Great. Let's allow you to make those mistakes hundreds of times, right? In a, you know, where the only consequence is losing points and you'll be able to train your brain. And that is way more effective than any of these other methods. There are some folks that are doing this. Like, yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen like Dragon Box. It's a game where you play, uh, um, you, it's like this fun little puzzle game. You play with monsters. You're trying to like balance the puzzle. And then it basically like by level 15, you realize like, oh, this is teaching me how to balance algebraic equations. But I didn't know because I was just playing a fun game. Right, right. And I think that is really the 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 panacea. Is okay. Like this is what in healthcare we're doing this like, oh, you just play a game and you learn how to manage a ventilator. You play a game, you learn how to manage diabetes, right? Like that is how it should work. Mm -hmm. And you rewire your brain the same way angry birds does well do you, do you are you starting to see other companies in the space try to go after some of those other markets or is it still early in in, in the game here it feels very early yeah um we are uh you know i i, I like i i still struggle to find i think good examples of this that are really high production value where the games are objectively fun 
And fun is important, not just because it makes it more engaging and gets people to play it, but because like fun is how we learn. Like you got to trigger dopamine release at the optimal frequency to, that's how we drive learning. Like right. you need it to be fun. And I feel like there are a few examples, but they're, they're few and far between. Hopefully, like you sort of said at the beginning, like my hope is that, you know, like when you look at the video games industry, we just passed $200 billion a year in revenue. Okay, you know, the, the industry has enjoyed year over year, in most cases, double digit revenue growth. We keep expanding audience, we keep increasing engagement. Okay, what's next? Like, where's the next hundred billion going to come from? Yeah, it's not coming from NFT based games, mm -hmm. you know, even though a bunch of money went after that. Like, I, I don't think it's necessarily going to come even from VR or these headsets. Like, I think it's going to come from, you know, a, a lot, you know, we have to, like, the way we expand the industry is through genre creation. And I think we're going to see new genres of professional games that is going to drive, you know, billions, if not tens of billions of dollars of growth for the industry. So, you know, we've seen a lot of layoffs and disruptions in the video game space. These major companies that are putting out big, big, you know, entertaining games uh, are also laying off their employees. You've seen, you know, when Microsoft bought Activision, then there was a big round of layoffs. Could those people that were let go, I mean, now, you've, now you've got this talent base to start looking at that. So where does, what needs to happen? Does it just need to have, you know, investor money and, and some money for these people to create their own companies or go after something that hasn't been met yet? Is that what needs to be the spark? I think in, uh, investor money is necessary, but yeah. not sufficient. Okay. Right? So you, and what do investors need? Investors need precedence. And so one of the great things, you know, we're proud at Level X to have been one of those flagships, right? We've created this highly successful company that is working with, you know, most of the top medical device and life science companies working with NASA. We, you know, raised capital, had a successful exit, um, were acquired by a large med tech company. So like it shows that you can build businesses like this. And that gives you the comparable that investors are looking for. So now like, so we're happy that we've made raising capital in the space easier because we have this successful case study. The, the, but the, that capital needs like the most important thing is the talent, right? You need to get not just people from the games industry, but the top people, the people who really can not only apply game design skills, but apply them in new disciplines and not only apply these engineering and art skills, but apply them in new disciplines. You get those people, put them together. That's where you see, you know, you're going to revolutionize all these industries you described construction, education and beyond. Now, now you mentioned um, that you're doing some work with NASA. What, what, are you doing there? Because that also seems like a, a simulation um, gold mine for for potential people that want to go to space or Mars, right? Oh yeah. So our focus with NASA is all around. Um, our focus with NASA is all around uh, actually ultrasound training. So we okay. have a multi year grant from NASA. Um, let me pull some of it up, maybe. Um, so we have a, a multi-year grant from NASA um, to basically we built the most realistic ultrasound simulator uh, ever created <laughs> um, to train astronauts how to basically deal with medical emergencies and diagnoses on deep space missions. Okay. Um, and actually, one of the um, uh, as as an early step. We actually have a game that's launching next month on the SpaceX Polaris Dawn mission, uh, where the astronauts are going to be playing one of our games uh, at, at, as ultrasound training as part of the medical experiments that they're conducting in space about how microgravity affects blood flow. See, medical see experiments in space can be fun, too. They don't have to be very dry. <laughs> no, and here we go. It's like, what, 25 years ago, I was flying spaceships for... PlayStation two cutscenes for star Wars episode <laughs> one games. And right. now we are 25 years later and we're putting video games up on the space exhibition to train astronauts how to deal with medical emergencies. So again, a lot of these are on, on, on mobile apps right now, or they're on mobile devices. Are, are you seeing, uh, is there room for other platforms? Uh, you know, you mentioned you didn't think that AR VR was something where these might succeed, but you know, what about on just PCs or, you know, the vision pro, I mean that it, it's, it feels like that's ripe for some of these apps, right? Vision Pro is awesome. I, I don't mean to, I, I don't mean to like dismiss VR and okay. AR and whatnot. So, so we, um, we actually do AR and VR games. Um, the challenge we've had, and this is, I think the challenge everyone's facing, not just in 
medical is, you know, we've had over a million medical professionals play our games on mobile and web. We've had maybe 60 or 70,000 play like mobile AR, like where you use AR kit on your phone. We've had probably seven or 8,000 play in headsets, which is still a lot, but that's two orders of magnitude smaller. Right. Um, so the reach just isn't there. The installed base just isn't there. Well, and it, it, over so, time, that'll change. Yeah. So, so as, as a CEO of a company that makes these games, do you have to then wait for the hardware to get to the point where you're like, okay, well now there's, we've reached a hardware tipping point. Uh, and, and, and now we know that there's, cause again, everyone's got a phone. So obviously, yeah, yeah you, you want to develop an app that, that goes to that hardware. Um, but if, if we could get to that point where most people have either, um, I want to say either a headset or smart oh. glasses, something like that could work, right? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, r- right now, there, you know, 98% of what you need, you can, you have on a phone, right? We say like, there is so much that you can learn that healthcare can learn from the video games industry before you strap a brick to your head, right? Like all of, you know, diagnosis, treatment, all, surgery, all this, like actually a lot of it runs great on a phone or on a PC or on web. There are specific scenarios where you want to have VR, AR, like if you're in, you know, certain procedures where it's all about your position relative to the patient, or you really need the stereo view for certain endoscopic procedures, their VR is like really helpful. But that's like, you know, a single digit, you know, two or three percent. Yeah. The rest, it's like, it's helpful, but it's not like a major difference. And therefore, the like lack of install base and also the barrier of this heavy thing on your head doesn't give you enough benefit over time as like you said you know if you just follow all the curves eventually it'll be a pair of glasses everyone's going to have one then great then we'll be doing tons of stuff on right. those headsets or right those call it smart glasses damn you can't get too far ahead of the horse you have to wait for the the, the horse to get there or at least with the hardware yeah i mean again like and don't like i'm super excited about v i love vr <laughs> okay. um and ar and we do great things with it but yeah. you know everything you know you it's important not to like chase shiny objects and like focus, you know, the way is just to focus on the business need. Like, all right, who do we need to reach? You know, what do we need to teach them? And, you know, what is the, going to be the most efficient and effective way of doing that? All right. So, the, you know, you, you said shiny object, and that made me think of my next question. The latest shiny object, obviously, in this space is generative AI and, and the whole machine learning and, and things like that. Do you, are you looking at that in, in your industry as well? Is that something that, that can help you generate content for uh games like the first thing i thought of was um uh, a training tool or game for therapists where you can then train them on ai patients who might respond differently to uh, some of the questions i'm trying to think of where you would generate content and ideas through gen ai we are using gen ai all over the place and just like the entire video games industry is i actually think in terms of industries the video games industry has the healthiest approach to gen ai because everyone else is like, oh my gosh, my job. And in the video games industry, we're like every, you know, every five years, a video game artist needs to be able to deliver an order of magnitude more content and an order of magnitude more detail. So a video game artist, if you're doing the same thing you were doing five years ago, there's something wrong with you. Like you always, there's always, I have, you know, you're always moving to the next generation of tools that is going to allow you to make content in order of magnitude more efficiently. And we've seen this going from, you know, literally hand-drawn stuff, pixel by pixel to, you know, crazy 3D modeling tools that you model in clay, procedural tools. Now, if you look at, you know, Unreal Engine and whatnot, you can just like drag a line and it'll like fill out a street for you. Like these tools are amazing. Um, And generative AI is just sort of like, our healthy approach is thinking about it as just the next step um in that evolution so we're embracing it wholeheartedly we're using it for content creation we're using it to solve hard engineering problems Mm -hmm. coding um across the board and i think that the video games industry's approach to generative ai i think is helpful for everybody just in terms of how to think about it as an employee um i think the way that we're training our generative ai systems is actually helpful for healthcare outside of like training. I mean, I look at, you know, what are the, one of the major problems in healthcare is um, racial bias. Like talk about dermatology, like classic problem is, you know, dermatologists don't know how to recognize skin disease on skin of color. You always hear about these like melanoma detectors that can't detect 
you know, melanoma on darker skin tones. Yeah. Like the video games industry. So one of the things like we've been doing at level X is using procedural methods like, you know, video game procedural methods to generate artificial skin. So we've built systems that allow us to generate basically <laughs> any skin disease on skin of any color under any lighting environment. And we've been using this stuff to, I mean, it's, it's, it's video game tools. Like an artist can sit down and turn dials and generate any combination of plaque psoriasis or anything that you want. But because we can now generate you know, all of these skin diseases and it looks real, we've been using this to train dermatologists how mm -hmm. to treat patients who have different skin tones. You can also use this to train AI, right? We call this, um, we call this synthetic data. Yeah. You can reduce bias in, in AI systems. Like here's an area where I think video games can make a huge contribution to society. There's been some, some controversy around synthetic data though, right? Cause it, sometimes it could feel like you're copying a copy of a copy. Uh, Correct. So you got to be a bit, yeah, it, yeah, garbage in, garbage out. Right. So you're right. When you do synthetic data, you've got to make sure you you don't want to just use ChatGPT to just output to train the next generation of ChatGPT. But here, you know, we're using like, for example, if you've seen um, like Unreal Engine five, they have like amazing demos of um, like these. You know, AI, these are actually Gen AI generated, like super ultra realistic character animation with like mm -hmm. ultra realistic muscles. That is actually these AI systems are trained on simulation. They're trained on procedural methods. And so we can apply the same techniques, you know, again, like, yeah, if you just take AI and have it train AI, that's not doing anything. But if you have like a complex simulation, like of skin or of muscle, and you now want to... Uh, you can now use that to train AI systems that are yeah. smarter, high quality synthetic data. That's exactly the point, Keith. So as, as we talk about uh, realistic images and CGI and things like that, it, that it reminds me of the question around the Uncanny Valley where uh, there's a gap between something that's generated by a computer versus a, a realistic photo video type type of scenario. Do you find this issue comes up at all in, in some of the medical stuff or are, are the doctors and, and, and professionals asking you, no, 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 be as realistic as possible. And, and it doesn't have to, it might look creepy looking, but that doesn't matter. Um, so it's less about creepy looking or not. Okay. Um, because I mean, we just did a colonoscopy, like it's all, <laughs> right. you know, it's not about creepy looking, but I think there is an interesting question about abstraction. So it's not always just about making it completely realistic. Often we want to visualize things in ways like when we're making these games, we often will visualize things in ways you can't actually see them in real life precisely to help you develop that mental model. Right. So we might visualize, um, you know, things under, uh, you know, under like a certain cutaway view or we might show like, for example, we do things in radiation oncology. You can't see a radiation beam in real life, right? But right. we'll show it to you because we want you to see where it's hitting the heart. And so we find we're all, just like in video games, you'll have sort of all sorts of um, what do we call like non-realistic uh, cartoony style rendering or, you know, rendering of, sort of different visual styles. We're doing the same thing because you want to choose the visual style that's going to really help your brain develop that mental model. Sometimes you need it to be realistic, like the skin examples where it's like, I need that skin to look as realistic as possible. Yeah. Because that's how like literally whether the disease manifests above or below the pigment is going to dictate how it looks on different skin tones. But for other procedures like surgery or radiation oncology or other things, you might want to show things that the doctor actually doesn't see in real life. Yeah. Yeah. So, do, you know, I, I'm a, a, a tech optimist here, so I'm pretty open to the idea of this to, to help training, but do you still run into skeptics? Do you still run into some people that are like, well, it's still, it's still a video game and, you know, traditional education is still the best or, or do you not see that at all from, from, from the medical we, profession, I guess. We used to, yeah. um, the beauty of video games though, is you can, I mean, you see sort of what I'm doing here. You just demo it, right? Yeah. Somebody doesn't believe you, you say, well, try this. And then they're converted. Right. Um, I think part of the reason for that stigma is people just didn't, like you saw what we were doing here, it was running crazy 3D fluid dynamics on a cell phone. Like nobody knew that that was possible. Like no one knew that you had that kind of compute power that that was possible. The second they realized that it was, mm -hmm. okay, wait a minute, now this makes sense. So I feel like, you know, sort of early on in level X, maybe the first 
six or seven years, we'd say, oh, what do you do? We make video games for doctors. And people would raise an eyebrow, like, what does that mean, video games for doctors? Now people go like, oh yeah, I heard about that, video games for doctors. My expectation is, and like sort of our vision is like in the next five years or so, you're gonna say video games for doctors. Say, oh yeah, video games for doctors. When, when was that not a thing? Right. Right? We always had video games for doctors. Yeah. And it just becomes part of the, like we say, you know, we talk about accelerating the adoption curve in healthcare. What accelerates things? A force. So we say, we just want games to be accepted as a fundamental force in healthcare. Just like you have lectures and you have video and you have cadaver labs, like, oh yeah, games, you know what? This new technique we just came up with, you really need to develop a mental model of this. We need a video game for this. And it just becomes part of, we talk about in games, making a new genre. In healthcare, it's just creating this fundamental force where every doctor, company, medical society goes, yeah, you know what, we need a video game for that. Yeah, yeah. So so two final questions for you, Sam. First of all, is is your family now uh, proud of you? <laughs> As, they, as you mentioned at <laughs> the beginning, I'm assuming they are. I, I You know, again, you know, how does your family feel about, about how you've turned this into a, a successful company? So I don't know that my dad will admit it, <laughs> but he does love being able to stop by the office and drive all the game designers crazy with whatever his <laughs> ideas are for yeah. video levels and anesthesiology. So he's having a good time. And, and then, all right. And the next question then is, do you, do you find yourself still following the video game industry? Uh, and, you know, are you still being, a, can you still play games uh, that are not medical games? That <laughs> I mean, or, I need to play games that yeah. are not medical games. So, yeah, I mean, we, at Level X, like we're still, we're on stage at SIGGRAPH. We're on stage at Game Developer Conference. Like we're, you know, we talk about these, these, you know, layoffs in the industry, like at Level X, we've, it's, been a boon for recruiting we, yeah. we're getting amazing talent into the team so like we're always staying up to speed and one of the reasons is it's not just that we're using the game technology we're using the game mechanics so we're using you know we think about diagnosing a rare disease that's a reduct forget cool graphics that's just a that's a reductive reasoning puzzle yeah. from a game design perspective so we're always playing some of the latest like mobile game mechanics around you know they have assembly games they have um uh collection games they have puzzle games and we're looking at this and we're pattern matching and we're saying you know what actually the way this game works would really be useful to explain this concept and all right great let's start you know um let's because we want to use the mechanics that have already been honed and proven on a you know billion unsuspecting test subjects right right all right, yeah, uh, Sam. Again, we could go on for for another hour about a lot of this stuff, but um, uh, I appreciate the time to, to to talk with us today. It was great stuff. Likewise, it's a lot of fun. Anytime. Hey, yeah, where can people go if if they're interested in in learning more about about you guys? Oh, just go to www.levelx.com. It's levelex.com, um, right. and you can check out some of our games. You can apply for a job. All sorts of cool stuff. All right. That's your free commercial. That's, that's about it. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Sam. All right. That's all the time we have for today's episode. Be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, add any thoughts you have below. Join us every week for new episodes of Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. Thanks for watching.